participating. And um, uh, today's session is one of the important symptoms to be picked up well and appropriately managed. So um, as without with best utilization of the time, we'll go ahead with the case presentation. And once that is done, we'll have the faculty presentation and then discuss both together. Fine, uh, Shripriya, go ahead sure, with the case presentation. Uh, Dr. Ami, uh, I can see you logged into the meeting. Will it be possible for you to read out or should we read out and then? Uh, yeah, I can read it out as long as my internet connection stays okay. Perfect. Maybe you can switch off the video for the time being if the strength is very Yeah. Over yeah. oh, to you, Dr. Ami. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, presenting a, uh, the case of Sunita. Actually, the slide hasn't changed in my page. Uh, uh, it's still showing just case presentation. If you want, if you want, doctor, they can do that. It is changing now. They can do the presentation. Like they can do the slide uh, screening and. Uh... We are sharing from our end only. Okay. Okay. And then you just tell them and then, and then keep going. Okay. Go ahead. This is the Sunita, 78 year old lady. Um, her final diagnosis was adenocarcinoma of the lung with metastasis to the left tibia. And in her second presentation, she basically had a cerebrovascular accident for which we, uh, uh, we had, uh, which is when she had the delirium. So when she first presented to us um, uh, a year ago, she had a swelling on the leg and then all the investigations finally led us to the final diagnosis of adenocarcinoma with metastasis to the tibia. But the, the, uh, the second admission, which is when she had the delirium, her presenting complaints was difficulty in speaking for two days, left-sided weakness for two days, difficulty in eating for two days, and irrelevant talking for one day. So I just want to bring in over here that when she uh, after the first, uh, first diagnosis, she was just undergoing palliative care at home. And the relatives also did not want further management. But when she had these acute, this acute onset of symptoms, that's when they brought her again to the hospital to see if there's any reversible cause for, uh, for this altered sensorium and irrelevant talking. Yeah. So she was apparently well a year ago when she started having pain in the left leg and the pain was dull, aching and constantly pre uh, present. She was able to ambulate and could uh, could bear weight on the affected limb. So over 15 days, then the swelling over the proximal part of the tibia was uh, gradually increasing and uh, there was pain, tenderness, and slowly she was in, uh, unable to bear weight on that leg as well. She was investigated as an outpatient and uh, initially we had thought it is uh, it looked like an osteosarcoma or uh, or you know some uh, bone tuberculosis of the bone or something but the biopsy came out as um, a metastatic carcinoma to the tibia and they found that the primary was a lung uh, adenocarcinoma uh, given her age and advanced stage of cancer the family opted to give her palliative care at home for the remainder of her life her son is a health assistant in our hospital, so he said he was able he'll he'll be able to give her whatever uh, care she needed at home. Um, three days before the current admission, the second admission was when she started having difficulty in speaking and left-sided weakness, which was sudden in onset. She suffered a fall in her bedroom following which she complained of severe pain in the left lower limb. She had difficulty swallowing food. And one day prior to admission, she started talking irrelevantly and was uh, therefore brought to the hospital. On examination, she was very uh, agit uh, agitated. She was restless. She was talking irrelevantly. She, uh, uh, she was in altered sensorium. She had all the cachexic features of a, of, uh, of a uh, malignancy. She, uh, on systemic examination, she was, she had pallor. The left leg, the swelling was, um, there was a, a, a pedal edema. And of course, the swelling of the tibial metastasis was also present. Her pulse rate was 110 per minute, BP 160 by 110. Respiratory rate was 34. And her saturation was 89% of oxygen. On the left tibia, the five to seven centimeter bony swelling was there on the proximal part of the tibia with tenderness and warmth. Later, we found that there's a, there was a fracture of the existing uh, swelling. Uh, on the chest, there was a decreased breath sounds on the left infrascapular region. 
Uh, CNS examination, left side, the power was two by five, reflexes was not present and Babinski's sign was positive. Um, uh, further, uh, further investigations revealed the HB was 7.2, her total counts was 18,000. There was a pathological fracture of the tibia at the site of metastasis. Slab was given for the left leg and she was immobilized and uh, the left, sorry, the left leg was immobilized. NG tube was inserted, NG feeds in, uh, initiated and oxygen by nasal prongs at two liters per minute. So the psychosocial aspects, she hailed from a poor village. Uh, we have uh, Senthal uh, tribe. Senthals are basically from Jharkhand, but they migrated here. And we've got Senthal tribes as well as Mahadalit and Musahari tribes in Bihar. So these people are from the Senthal tribes. Her son is a health assistant, and uh, he's the one who brought her in for investigations um, to our hospital. And he's uh, very much, he was very much involved in her care. Her husband died of tuberculosis 11 years ago. She has three sons and a daughter, and all, all of them uh, support her. Given her age and the advanced stage of uh, cancer, the family had opted to give her palliative care at home for the remainder of her life. However, when she had this acute onset of uh, uh, altered sensorium and she had the fall in the bathroom following which she had altered sensorium, they brought her to the hospital. So, so um, yeah, next, next slide. Please. So this was what was uh, started, injection, septride, so on one gram in view of the two accounts were high. She was uh, started on morphine for pain and uh, Pantop and uh, Cremafin. Um, after this, actually, just to say, just to uh, note that the patient then, uh, you know, she, the uh, relatives didn't want any further investigation. So uh, we finally just uh, discharged her to go home and uh, Within a few days, she actually passed uh, passed away peacefully at home uh, with her family. So the main concerns here was, uh, sorry, just stay on that. Yeah, uh, the cause of the stroke was undetermined. So as a physician, I wondered if you know if we found out if there's some reversible cause of stroke, would you know would that have been justified in uh, you know examining, investigating in this kind of a patient? The delirium was distressing for relatives, so um, I, I don't think we adequately uh, addressed that specific issue, the delirium itself. Um, yeah, next slide. So um, on summarizing, this is, this is a 78-year-old lady diagnosed case of adenocarcinoma lungs with tibial metastasis. And she was undergoing palliative care at home. And she came to the hospital with sudden deterioration, and uh, which is most uh, likely a stroke, a cerebrovascular accident. She was discharged uh, uh, and uh, just given palliative care at home. And within a few days, she passed. Yeah. Yeah, so some, uh, uh, like I said, the first thing I wanted to ask was, is it justified to send her home without really investigating the cause of this acute um, onset of altered sensorium? So in patients like this who are already on palliative care, if they are, um, you know, if something irreversible, uh, if something that is possibly reversible or treatable, is it justified to treat? Is it justified to um uh, actually investigate further rather than just sending them home. Uh, do we discuss each point before I uh, talk about all the discussion points? Dr. Uh, Dr. Actually, we do have Dr. Pankaj also joining in. So how do you prefer, like discussing these points yes. now? Or? We'll do it afterwards uh, because better to know about delirium and then we will uh, go into each yeah. one of it. All these have to be discussed. Uh, thank you for taking us through the case. It, it's an ideal and appropriate case. And all your queries and even like the previous one, what you asked, will be, can be answered once we have the uh, topic okay. in yeah. detail. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amy. We will definitely take up the discussion points once the faculty's uh, session is over. So uh, now I would like to uh, have Dr. Ratha introducing the faculty of the day, Dr. Panga Sinha to us. Uh, hello. I'm sorry. Hello. I'm a bit late uh, to join. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. 
warm welcome to Dr. Pankaj Sinha. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you for this session. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. is, he's um, associate professor uh, and consultant in charge in the Department of Palliative and Supportive Medicine at Sri Aurobindo Medical College and PG Institute Indoor. And um, Dr. Pankaj is, has, it looks like he has a really a keen interest in palliative care uh, and also both education and research which is shown by his interest in taking us through this session itself. And uh, he has been involved in various national and international education programs too. And uh, he is a national faculty and also uh, is one of the uh, re reviewers for the BMJ Supportive Care and the Indian Journal of Palliative Care. And uh, he has also got more accolades to his um, name. He has been the winner of the Bruce Davis Gold Medal in Palliative Care in 2015-16, which is awarded by the Palliative Medicine Cori Code Kerala, India. And he has also obtained some international grants from the Association of Hospice and Palliative Care, and uh, which is which is giving him more interest and uh, further persuasion in the field of supportive care in cancer patients. And also, it's, he's a member of the Indian Association of Palliative Care. So it, with, without much ado, I would request Dr. Pankaj Sinha to go take us through this topic. Delirium is something which is very, very essential for all of us to know and manage it appropriately. Thank you so much, Madam, for kind introduction. Uh, without wasting any time, we'll start with our topic. I hope in, in these 10, 15 minutes, you had some interaction among yourself, some discussion, I hope. Yeah. Uh, can we have somebody... just done the case presentation, Dr. Pankaj, so okay. that once uh, we just did the case presentation, which was to be done, so that after your uh, topic, we can discuss, can have a discussion on both okay. together. That, okay. that uh, good utilization of time. Yeah, uh, Sri, can you please uh, share the screen or you can enable me to share the screen? So you already have the access. In case you want us to share, we can do it. Also. Uh, it shows host is disabled participant screen uh, share. Okay. No problem. You can uh, you can share from your side. Okay. Screen is already shared. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, today we will be talking uh, one of a very important symptom that we see in uh, patients who are suffering, uh, who are elderly, and especially it is very, very common uh, when patients reaches at uh, terminal stages. Okay. So uh, we will begin with a case scenario. It is very common, uh, like uh, um, uh, elderly gentleman who is diabetic, he uh, was tobacco chewer. And a uh, few weeks back, he was diagnosed with uh, advanced carcinoma of buccal mucosa, uh, for which he was receiving IV chemotherapy. And then he presented suddenly with uh, seizure episodes. A patient was initially admitted to ICU, and then he was referred to uh, acute palliative care ward for further care. A uh, family uh, reported that he was unable to sleep properly, especially during the nights. And during the daytime, he behaves inappropriately with his family members. He tries to pull out his IV lines, tries tubes, and it's a, uh, And also, uh, they say that uh, uh, he's more sleeping uh, uh, during the daytime. Okay. Uh, so this is something, uh, common presentations, which we see in delirium. Uh, and this is a common diagnosis we make uh, in the clinical diagnosis in such stages. So what does delirium means? It is derived from a Latin word. Uh, you can go to the next one. Yeah, uh, that means to be crazy. Uh, that was taken from B and Lera. Uh, that means to go out of furrow. In common words, we call it as acute confusional state or altered state of consciousness. So when we talk about consciousness, what does it mean? Can you go to next slide, please? Uh, next slide. Yeah, so consciousness, whenever we talk about, 
uh, there's common uh, analogy with uh, a radio system. So in a radio, uh, there are three, uh, 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 three um, switches are there. One is on off switch. There's one volume, uh, volume button and there is a tuning, uh, uh, tuning button. So uh, 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 they, have, uh, they have compared this thing with three, three components of consciousness. One is awakeness. So mostly uh, the patients are either awake or they are uh, drowsy or sleepy. So this is like patients, whether it is on or off, that is one state of consciousness. Another thing is alert, how much alert a patient is. So uh, this is like how much patient is ready to receive or process someone's information. Like if we ask someone's uh, name or, uh, or, uh, or what does he do or what are the family members around. So that means uh, what information, whether he is able to receive or whether he is able to process. And then third very important uh, co uh, content is uh, awareness. Awareness is the content of consciousness. It is fine tuning with the uh, environment. So for a person to be conscious, we need all three things, uh, awakeness, alertness, and awareness. Um, and if there is any of these things are changed, patients may feel uh, uh, in altered state of consciousness. Next slide, please. So DSM-5, uh, uh, has defined delirium by mainly three criterias. So first, there is disturbance in attention. How do we call it as disturbance in attention? That is reduced ability to direct, focus, sustain, and shift attention. So the patients may not be able to focus on something or they may not be able to sustain the attention or when we talk about shifting the attention from one thing to another, the patients may not be able to do things. And uh, one thing is about attention, another is about the awareness. So this is recently they have changed in I think 2022 or 23, uh, that uh, you know, the reduced awareness to the environment is, um, uh, is something about uh, uh, disturbance in attention. Uh, these things can happen in other conditions like um, dementia or in psycho um, other psychosis and all, and even in depression. So how do we differentiate this thing from delirium? So in delirium, usually this disturbance develops over a very short period of time. That's maybe a few hours to a few days rather than weeks or months. And it uh, usually represents an acute change from baseline attention or awareness. And usually it fluctuates uh, in severity during the course of the day. So sometimes patients may be a bit drowsy and then uh, after some time patients may be very, very agitated. Uh, so that is one important uh, thing which we, which, we, which we differentiate from depression and dementia especially. Then the third criteria is disturbance in cognition. So there may be some memory deficit, disorientation, there may be language disturbances, patients may speak inappropriately, and there may be some perception disturbances. So, uh, and uh, these things, these disturbance in attention and disturbance in cognitions, it should not be explained by any other pre-existing or neurocognitive disorders. And it does not uh, uh, occur in the context of severely reduced level of arousal, like as in coma and all. So uh, uh, what are the causes for these things? So in the definition of delirium, there should be some evidence from the history, physical examination or laboratory findings that this disturbance is caused by some physiological consequences of general medical condition. This medical condition can be anything. We will be talking about these things like there may be some infections, some medications use, um, and some substances, or some, uh, some change in, in the normal physiology. Next slide, please. So uh, this question is for you, all of you. In our case, in Mr. Verma, what all features of 
delirium were there, where you can feel this can be delirium. In, yeah, you, you just saw through the definition of delirium. Can you say this patient fit into the criteria of delirium? Anyone, please? You can unmute or put it on the chat. Uh, we'll take 30 seconds only. Someone wants to unmute. Okay, so there is a short duration. And the things happened in just 24 hours. Uh, reduced alertness. Okay, and patient is more drowsy. Yeah, there is a history of agitation, change in behavior, and inappropriate talking. Again, that is the change in the, uh, the, the behavior. Okay, very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other thing? We discussed basically three criteria, isn't it? Anyone wants to add anything? So patient was uh, before uh, like 24 hours or some days back, he was almost all right. And then there was some, uh, some medical condition and then uh, he, he developed these, these things. And uh, the behavior is changing. Sometimes patient is drowsy, and sometimes patients is more uh, agitated or behaving inappropriately. Okay. Um, right now we haven't discussed. I think about the medications history, but yeah, that is very very important when when we talk about delirium. Okay. So moving forward, next slide, please. Uh, as we said that uh, the course of delirium can be very, very um, uh, acutely changing. So normally the patient is usually alert and calm. When patient is more combative, agitated or restless, we call it as hyperactive delirium. In this hyperactive delirium, usually patients talk more, talk inappropriately or patient uh, um, uh, tries to pull out the things like um, the bed sheets, clothes, IV lines, attitudes, for his catheters, or sometimes try um, to run away and all. This is very, very common situation and like very, very, uh, uh, what we call patient doesn't like uh, a patient, uh, a family members doesn't like patient to see in this condition. Another form of delirium can be just opposite of this, like patient is more lethargic, sedated patient uh, is more sleepy and doesn't want to talk much uh, this is usually under diagnosed in most of our patients they feel like patient is more sleepy uh, and sometimes they feel the patient is depressed or doesn't want to talk uh, but this uh, delirium even uh, is even more common but most common form of delirium, what we see is mixed kind of delirium. So sometimes this patient is hyperactive and other time patient is uh, hypoactive. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so how common is uh, epidemiology? Mm. Uh, so this is quite common, as I said, that in palliative care, we see uh, from somewhere around 25% at admission to 85% in last weeks of uh, the life. Most of this incidence and prevalence uh, are seen in uh, elderly people, uh, elderly more than 55 years of age, uh, uh, there may be around 1% of uh, population. And when we see in 85 uh, and elderly, then it is somewhere around 13%. And what is wrong with delirium is the mortality rates in these patients who, who shows delirium is quite high. That may be around 22 to 76%. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, as we, uh, we can see in uh, different kind of patients, the prevalence and incidence range and the first, like in critical care patients, the incidence may be 16 to 83%, uh, while in terminally ill patients, they had seen uh, 83% uh, uh, patients. 
in those uh, elder care institute, institutionalized elderly, the prevalence rate is almost one in three patients they saw delirium. So it says that uh, uh, the incidence is quite high. Next slide. Uh, so what leads to delirium? Okay. Uh, can anyone uh, tell me what are the common uh, um, common causes or like how does it occur? What are the uh, neurotransmitter involved in delirium pathophysiology? Just to guess, what are the common neurotransmitters which are which is required to keep us alert or attentive? Um, general is related. Uh, okay, that is the cause. But how does it occur? What neurotransmitters are disturbed in elderly or those who are delirious? Mm -hmm. no, okay, acetylcholine. Very good. Thank you. So one of the neurotransmitters is acetylcholine. Uh, serotonin, okay, the dopamine, okay, yeah. So uh, the dopamine and serotonin uh, and and acetylcholine, these are the uh, main neurotransmitters that are that that are responsible for um, for delirium. Next slide, please. So this is called as a final common pathway, uh, where uh, the the the, uh, and the neurotransmitters starts from the thalamic area or uh, uh, the uh, 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 in the, in the medial vessel aspects of the cortex, and uh, these neurotransmitters goes into the cortex and other uh, other reasons. So mainly. Uh, uh, as you people said, there are three pathways, one uh, dopaminergic, one serotonergic, and then acetylcholine. Delirium usually happens when there is a change in these neurotransmitters. Usually when acetylcholine level reduces, uh, so that's what we see in uh, patients who are taking anticholinergic medications, um, uh, mostly for uh, uh, UTIs or for abdominal pain or some other antidepressant medications which they take and, and the, this leads to uh, loss of anticholinergic uh, system. Other thing what we saw is if there is more of dopamine and these things uh, can lead to increased uh, altered um, uh, attention of these patients. So this pathway where dopamine or acetylcholine is involved, these usually explain the symptoms, core symptoms of delirium like uh, disorientations, cognitive deficit, disturbance in sleep-wake cycles, uh, unorganized thinking, or language abnormalities. While there may be other causes uh, which, which leads to delirium and which causes like delusions, hallucinations, illusions, or affective uh, liabilities, these all things are because of other causes which may precipitate delirium. Okay, uh, when what, Medications do be used uh, usually in uh, in delirium. Anyone? Common medications which are used for delirium. We have almost fifty participants, and only three four people are responding. Haloperidol. Haloperidol. Yeah, haloperidol. Thank you so much. Uh, haloperidol is comes under anti anti psychotic medications. Correct. So um, that is used for acute delirium. Uh, anyone else? Uh, something is lorazepam. Uh, Dexmedetomidine is commonly used in um, uh, uh, ICUs, and it's, it's a, a fantastic drug. Okay. So, but yeah, the most commonly one used is uh, antipsychotics. We'll talk about using benzodiazepine in delirium, whether we should use or not use. But yeah, uh, respiridone and quetiapine, these all comes under antipsychotics. So there are two kinds of antipsychotics. One is typical and other another is atypical. Correct. So what is usually difference in typical and atypical uh, antipsychotics? Can anyone tell me? Sorry. 
Dr. Astos. Okay, so uh, usually what we, we talk about like the uh, serotonergic side effects are more, uh, are, uh, 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 serotonergic pathway is through the atypical. The extraperitoneal side effects, yeah, Dr. Sahina, uh, that are more with typical uh, uh, antipsychotic medications, which reduces the acetylcholine pathway uh, uh, quite a lot, and these things leads to extrapyramidal side effects. So, uh, next slide, please. Mm. Uh, so next we will be discussing about what all things can lead to delirium. This list is very exhaustive. We will talk about main causes what we see in, in uh, patients. So there may be one chronic diseases, any chronic uh, um, diseases, uh, especially in cancers. So those um, cancer byproducts or cytokines can cause delirium. There may be any uh, any any intracranial diseases. Very commonly, electrolyte imbalance, especially hyponatremia, hypercalcemias, can lead to uh, uh, delirium. Dehydration, which is very common in patients who have uh, severe vomiting or uh, diarrhea, can lead to this thing. Organ failure, like uremia, uh, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, cardiac failure, these can lead to uh, uh, toxins build up and can lead to delirium. Uh, sometimes paraneoplastic uh, syndromes uh, that can lead to electrolyte imbalances and can cause uh, delirium. Uh, hypoglycemia is one of very, very common uh, problem what we see in, in, especially in patients who are diabetic and taking anti uh, uh, glycemic, hypoglycemic medications. These can lead to hypoglycemia hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, these can cause uh, delirium. Infections, especially UTI and LRTIs, these things are one of the most common cause of delirium, especially in patients with uh, uh, who are elderly, hypoxemias, um, other medical conditions like withdrawal symptoms from alcohol, nicotine medications, uh, 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 the anemias, breathlessness, pain, these all things can lead to uh, delirium. There may be some side effects of chemotherapies or uh, 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 the com most commonly one, the medications like uh, use of opioids, anticholinergic medications, steroids, antidepressant medications, benzodiazepines, even sometimes uh, neuroleptics can cause delirium. Uh, so uh, you can see in this list, like these all causes uh, are very common in our patients who are into palliative care, especially <coughs> the medications part. We use you know, opioids, steroids, antidepressants very, very commonly, and these things can cause uh, delirium. One medication it, here it is written is about benzodiazepine. Uh, benzodiazepines, uh, we need to be very, very mindful if we are using in those patients who are agitated, not able to sleep, we need to evaluate them whether they are not into delirium, okay? Because benzodiazepines are very notorious to call delirium and it is easily missed. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in our case, Mr. Verma, what all risk factors you found which may make him prone for delirium? I want others also to answer, although there may be some repetition of answers, but please uh, put your uh, put your answers. What all things can uh, precipitate delirium? Do you want to see a, the second slide? Can you put the second slide, please? Mm, uh, from the beginning. Yes, uh, not this, this one, yeah. Previous, please. Yeah. Yeah, so one is is he is elderly, 66 year, okay. Chemotherapy, he recently received chemotherapies. Mm -hmm. 
he is diabetic so this can be you want to see whether patient should not be uh, 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 hypoglycemic okay very good mm -hmm. okay any other cause um, apart from diabetes is icu admission very important thing that uh, the icu psychosis is very very common and usually like this was a very short admission but if a patient is on prolonged icu admissions this can cause uh, delirium mm -hmm. okay uh, electrolyte imbalance because patient has presented with uh, seizures so patients with uh, um, head and neck cancers, CA buccal mucosas, are very commonly present with hyponatremia or hypercalcemias. These can cause uh, cause uh, uh, delirium also. Yeah, um, yeah. It is a fourth stage cancers. Patient uh, may have some metastasis or maybe extension of the disease. So it is, but as such, disease itself can lead to uh, to delirium. Poor nutrition, decreased sleep, postictal delirium, okay, mm, lack of sleep, altered sleep cycle. Yeah, so thank you so much. I think we have covered almost all the causes uh, which which may uh, which may lead to delirium. One thing I think we didn't talk about was maybe many a times if a patient with cancer if they present with seizures, they uh, they use steroids also. Uh, and in chemotherapies also we use a lot of steroids to prevent nausea vomiting so that can also lead to uh, this thing uh, infections are very common in post chemotherapy patients that can uh, cause delirium yeah but uh, uh, i think very good response from all of you uh, these all things we need to think about when when we are suspecting any patients with delirium okay can we go back to our slide uh, the causes of uh, delirium. Next, next, yeah, uh, uh, previous one, previous one, please. Yeah, so uh, this is one of the risk factors what we saw in, in patients who are post-surgical in general medical population and patients with cancers. So there are numbers of things which may be patient, uh, present in patients with cancers or any other chronic life limiting illnesses, uh, these things can can uh, lead to uh, to delirium. So we need to be very mindful about the risk factors associated. Okay, next slide, please. So when we uh, diagnose delirium, as we discussed in DSM criteria, uh, uh, there may be different kind of clinical features, either the patients may be hyper alert or hypo alert, or this can be mixed delirium. And the attention is usually impaired. Patients may not remember what you asked for. And the sleep wake cycle is a very, very early indicator of delirium. Patients sleep more during the day and doesn't sleep during the night. Mm, um, as we say, saw the motor changes, hyperactivity or hypoactivity, mood changes, patient sometimes is, doesn't want to talk, sometimes talks excessively or some uh, uh, <clears throat> pulling out things. Hallucinations and delusions can be a feature of delirium also. And then there may be some uh, cognitive failures, which we see usually in uh, mini mental status examination. And then uh, in the uh, physical examinations, you might feel the flapping tremors or myoclonus, uh, uh, which is usually seen in patients with, uh, with medications or uh, with organ failures. So these are the common features of delirium. Next slide. Then <clears throat> there are some screening tools which may help us to identify those patients who are at risk or early indicators of uh, uh, delirium. So MMSC is a common bedside tool that we can use and it hardly takes five to 10 minutes to do a quick MMSC. Another even quicker test is to ask a patient to draw a clock. Clock uh, with a round, you need to put the number and you put 
correct uh, correct uh, their uh, minutes and hours indicator if a patient is able to do those all things then then uh, uh, the patient is at low risk of uh, of delirium it is very important in patients with hepatic encephalopathy we usually ask the patients to do it during the rounds and it's a very quick test to do next slide then there are some uh, next slide please uh, diagnostic tests like confusional assessment method or uh, confusional assessment method for ICUs. <laughs> this can be used in those patients who are not able to talk. In, in these, we use CAM ICU. Next slide. So this CAM uh, has four uh, features, uh, which we saw in DSM also. Acute onset and fluctuating course. There are features of inattention, disorganized thinking, and altered level of consciousness. So first, that is acute onset and uh, inability to uh, focus attention. These two are the primary uh, criteria, essential criteria. And either three or four, if it is there, then this is a definitive <laughs> diagnosis of uh, delirium. Next, uh, this thing. Uh, another scale, which like we have numerical rating scale for pain, uh, we have a scale for uh, delirium, which is a uh, by uh, by side means we can see the hyper uh, active delirium and hypoactive delirium on this, and also we can measure whether it is a mixed delirium. So sometimes a patient is on the more uh, agitated, it will be yellow or red. If a patient is uh, hyperactive, it will be uh, on the uh, light green to the dark green. Uh, uh, so. It is from zero to plus four and to zero to minus five. Uh, we can mark these things and we can note down the severity of delirium. Next slide, please. Then um, uh, uh, there are few bedside indicators like we ask um, the um, patients to check for level of consciousness, whether he's alert, aware or attentive. Uh, whether patient is hyper alert or hypo alert, patient is unarousable or comatose. Then there are some tests of attention like um, the orientation of time. Uh, we ask the patient to draw something or write their home address. Um, there are inability to count uh, reverse from 20 to one or multiples of two or inability to recall three paired objects after two and five minutes. These things we also see in MMSE, but if we do not want to do complete MMSE, we can do some of these tests. Okay, next slide. Uh, so uh, uh, the change in cognition, there may be uh, other causes also. So it is important to differentiate this thing from uh, like uh, uh, cognitive disorders or dementia or depressions. So if a patient which presents with acute um, acute uh, change in uh, consciousness, and then we uh, see if there is any changes in attention or consciousness. If there are uh, a change in attention and consciousness, we will uh, check for change in cognition or perception. If those things are also there, then it is called it, it is in the diagnosis of delirium. If it is not there, then there may be some other cognitive uh, disorders. Uh, if there are no change in attention or consciousness, then we check for cognitive changes. Cognitive changes, if it is there and it, uh, these are for some time, then we can consider a diagnosis of dementia or uh, these are not uh, chronic, then there may be other cognitive disorders. If it is uh, associated with mood changes, then we will uh, consider the diagnosis of affective disorders. And uh, if these are not there, then uh, a patient who is presenting with change in attention or consciousness, uh, then uh, it may be other psychotic or other disorders we need to look for. Okay. Next slide, please. So uh, the common uh, uh, things which we usually uh, uh, get confused with is with the dementia, which has more of chronic onset, gradual onset, and patient sometimes is more alloy. 
uh, in depression, uh, this thing is more consistent. Uh, in hypoactive delirium, it is for few hours to few days, while depression is for weeks to months. And another thing is about the psychosis. So uh, uh, commonly, uh, schizophrenia uh, have more of the uh, hallucinations are more auditory. Uh, and uh, uh, delusions are uh, in, in, in delirium are mostly paranoid and less organized than in schizophrenia. Next slide. So <laughs> we have covered about the pathophysiology causes, uh, risk factors and diagnosis of delirium. Any questions so far? Is it clear or more confusing? We are talking about more confusing topics here. Yeah. Okay, I hope all of you are with me. So we will go for management. Uh, management for delirium is very simple, but very often we, we misdiagnose it. We miss these things. And even if we diagnose, we do not do the treatment properly. So. Uh, first and foremost, and I think the most effective uh, treatment or management of uh, delirium is about the prevention or prophylaxis. Whenever there are these patients who might be at the risk, we need to uh, educate patients and family members about the early signs of delirium and uh, uh, prevent these things by proper creating proper environment. Uh, always and always in palliative care, treat the cause, try to identify the cause, what may lead to delirium and then treat that thing rather than just giving antipsychotics or benzodiazepines. Only if a patient is uh, uh, actively dying, then you may omit uh, to test uh, for, uh, for cause of delirium. And at that time only we can use uh, directly antipsychotics or uh, uh, benzodiazepines. Then we need to um, treat the medical symptoms, especially if patient is hyperactive and uh, it is very urgent to treat these uh, hyperactivity symptom if it is breaching, uh, if it is leading to any, any, any risk uh, for patient or family members or, uh, or, or hospital staff. Then there are some environmental strategies uh, psychological interventions and uh, the pharmacological interventions. Can we go to next slide? So uh, when we talk about delirium management algorithm, uh, the first thing uh, is always about the assessment, diagnosis of delirium. If it, we have diagnosed and ruled out depression and dementia, then first is about the non-pharmacological interventions as we discussed. So for these things, uh, whenever we are doing, uh, we need to assess and treat all the reversible uh, causes of delirium by taking a good history, taking a full uh, physical examinations, review medications more often, and uh, uh, investigate the patient uh, as required based on your history and examination. Next slide, please. Uh, then uh, after non-pharmacological treatment, uh, there comes the pharmacological treatment. If a patient is hypoactive, we mostly avoid medications. And if at all required, we use antipsychotic medications in very minimum uh, effective dose. So uh, I use very small dose like 0.25 to 0.5 mg of haloperidol uh, in these patients if required. Otherwise, um, uh, the most effective treatment for uh, hypoactive uh, delirium is non-pharmacological, that is psychoeducation uh, uh, about the delirium and uh, um, using more uh, stimulus in these patients. Uh, when a patient is hyperactive, then we need to start with uh, uh, any antipsychotics. Usually we avoid benzodiazepines uh, and we increase the dose of uh, antipsychotics. If it is persisting, then we need to take specialist palliative care consultations. And if we find out that the delirium is not uh, 
uh, getting reversed, then we need to start uh, sedation therapy where we can use uh, anti-epileptics, uh, uh, sorry, uh, benzodiazepines or uh, anesthetic agents can be used at that point of time. In case a patient is very, very uh, hyper agitated and it is compromising the safety of patients, family member or staff, then uh, we can use uh, short-acting benzodiazepines along with antipsychotic medications like haloperidol, IV and uh, uh, haloperidol. Next slide, please. So uh, I hope this medication part is clear for all. Then we go for uh, prevention and prophylaxis. In some patients who are at very high risk, we can use haloperidol. But what we had seen that uh, using prevent, uh, preventive dose or prophylactic dose of uh, antipsychotic medication doesn't uh, reduce the incidence of delirium, but usually it shortens the duration of delirium. Next slide. Uh, we have already discussed that uh, we need to treat the causes. It may be infections. Uh, opioids, we need to remember that we do not stop opioids, especially if patient is having pain. And if a patient was already on opioids for long term, then no need to uh, stop opioids or even rotate opioid if a patient was already on opioid. We just need to see uh, uh, there should not be any overdose. There should not be any organ failure, like in patient with with uh, renal failure. And if a patient is on morphine, then that may um, may lead to delirium. But other if other things are okay, then uh, no problem to ch uh, change opioids. Uh, as we discussed, that pain itself can lead to delirium, and if it is inadequately controlled, that can also be the uh, risk factor for delirium. So yeah, we need to continue that thing. Uh, electrolyte collection is very important. Use uh, antipyretics. If hypoxemia is there, use oxygen, uh, correct the anemia, uh, give proper hydration. <laughs> these things, uh, these all things we need to do for reversing the reversible. Next thing, please. Uh, these are the common doses what we use. So this table I have taken from Tekken Wolf. Uh, so the haloperidol dose, usually we start with 0.5. Every um, 15 to 20 minutes, we check for delirium. If uh, it is not settled, then we double the dose. Uh, so like from 0.5 to 1, 1 to 2.5, 2.5 to 5. 10 and like 20. So mm, most of the patients, they, they respond with less than 5 mg uh, dose uh, of haloperidol. Uh, other drugs, which are atypical uh, neuroleptics, which is used uh, uh, not only uh, not in emergency, but uh, to maintenance, like olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine, uh, and benzodiazepines, whenever required, we usually prefer uh, a shorter acting like medazolam. And anesthetics, if it is required at all, we can use propofol uh, or thiopentone. These all things can be used for palliative sedation. Next line, next, um, this. <coughs> then environmental uh, management. So what all things do we use? Uh, to prevent uh, or in, in management of uh, delirium. Uh, so it depends again uh, about what kind of a patient is. If a patient is uh, hyperactive, then we uh, provide more of a, uh, more of a calm environment. Uh, if a patient is hyperactive, then we may use some, some environment that may be uh, uh, stimulus producing. Overall goal of environment is to provide a consistent, containing and predictable space for uh, delirious patients. So in this, like we do not want too many the new faces uh, for the patient. So we uh, always ask uh, nurses duty not to change it more frequently. Same doctor should visit the patients and not too many visitors should be there. Uh, reorientation is one of the most effective strategies. So we tell uh, family members to tell them about the day, time, 
days of the week. Uh, we can put some news or we can read some uh, newspapers, especially in those patients who are hypoactive. Some reality testing. We ask the family, uh, the patients about uh, 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 something and we correct those things if a patient is not uh, able to uh, uh, tell. Reassurance and explanation is very, very important, uh, especially for family members, because they might be thinking that this patient is, uh, what is wrong with the patient is he psychotic now. So reassurance and explanation about, uh, about this thing. One thing I think I haven't told you, this is very much reversible. Uh, 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 this condition is very much reversible. So we need to tell the family members that with correcting the correctables, these things can be reversed and anxiety reduction can be used. Uh, that uh, whatever uh, room we are using for patient, there should not be too much of noise. Uh, uh, the light should be uh, less intense, uh, especially in the night. Uh, we need to tell uh, proper sleep hygiene. So what usually happens, especially in hospitals, like uh, the uh, the drug chart, maybe there may be medications, one medication is going at two o'clock, there is a nursing assessment at four o'clock. These all things disturbs the patient's sleep. Uh, so we need to make those medications uh, so that the patient's sleep doesn't get too disturbed. Uh, a better uh, staff and patient communication, consistent staff and some stimulus modifications can be used. Uh, staff psycho education is also uh, very, very important because sometimes we, we interpret the behaviors of the patients. We should not just them. And uh, if there are some early indicators of uh, delirium are there, the nurses can identify those things and can, can report it to the treating team. Uh, in patients, uh, 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 in the pediatric patients, the supporting uh, uh, parents is also very important, and uh, uh, we can we can use our counseling to reduce the patient's anxiety and and why it is happening. Next slide, please. Uh, environment still change, as I already said, that in patients with hyperactive delirium, moving the patients to a uh, communal ward or to a single room is better. And uh, this patient uh, would be better if it is positioned close to nursing estate station and attempt to reduce the sensory overstimulus like very bright lights or like those uh, photographs in, in the wards. Uh, it is very commonly seen in pediatric patients that uh, they see this cartoon jumping around and all. So these things can be uh, avoided. Uh, using these uh, physical barriers is not recommended in these patients. We usually prefer the chemical uh, restraints like using um, uh, haloperidol infusions in, in these patients because this physical barrier can be a stimulus for the patients. Uh, in contrast to this, uh, in hypoactive delirium, we can... Uh, we can uh, uh, move these patients to a little bit uh, now, now the, the common words we can use. Uh, we can increase the level of social interactions. We ask family members to talk more with the patients, tell them about the common things happening around. We can put some family photographs. Uh, we can allow pets or others, uh, uh, other familiar things uh, from the home we can allow. Uh, for, uh, to improve the stimulus. Next slide, please. Uh, this, I think we have already talked about, uh, uh, about the haliperidol. If we are using IV or subcutaneously, we usually start with 0.5, uh, then repeat and double the dose if there is no control in 20 to 40 minutes. And uh, uh, if it reappears, then we use the last uh, dose, like we have if we have used the 5mg, we will repeat the 5mg dose. Once it is uh, controlled, then we can uh, introduce the oral uh, medications. Um, <clears throat> and once delirium clears, then we, need, we can uh, reduce the uh, antipsychotic doses. 
Next slide, please. Uh, what are the common errors? Many a times we uh, misdiagnose these patients. We term it as uh, over anxious, a uh, uh, patient is drowsy or patient is psychotic, these all things. Uh, delirious uh, agitation, sometimes we, uh, we get confused it with anxiety or akathisia. Uh, hyperactive delirium, as we discussed, it can be uh, commonly confused with depression. Uh, uh, benzodiazepines or opioids sometimes can worsen the delirium and we should use it very judiciously. And uh, very commonly what I have seen in many hospitals that we do not increase the dose of antipsychotics as per the response. And so different medications, uh, different patients may need different medications and we need to escalate the dose of antipsychotics. And most important, what we miss is about the psychoeducation to family members and providing them good supports. Okay. Uh, next slide. I think that is all uh, about the delirium. So thank you so much for your awakeness, alertness, and awareness. Any questions before we go to case presentations? Anyone? Any psychiatrist in this group? Uh, let us ask. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Really, it's a very important topic and you took us through very, very well. Important all three elements which have to be intact. And uh, delirium is something which has to be picked up and managed appropriately. Uh, and think the case also, what we have done is something similar. So first let us give uh, everyone the opportunity to ask the queries. And as you have asked, are there, are there psychiatrists in this forum? How many are there? Please unmute and say, or type in the chat. Or uh, even uh, Someone has asked yeah. something. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If delirium is not treated, what happens? Yeah. So, uh, uh, means if uh, delirium is not treated, uh, mm -hmm. one thing is if we are not treating the correctable things, then this will uh, uh, this will again uh, lead to another complications, and uh, uh, the delirium if we don't treat like pain it will affect the patient's quality of life very very drastically so uh, it is very very uh, uh, very very distressing to patients and for family members also yeah, so that is important to treat uh, the delirium uh, as a symptom and as a as a uh, as a sign of some other thing is going wrong okay. and there's another question like they've asked uh about mm -hmm. to clarify once again about benzodiazepine and yeah. the point as to why benzodiazepines are not given can you please repeat yeah it? so benzodiazepines what does it do it uh, suppress uh, the cortex level at the cortex cerebral cortex level and uh, if if you remember the pathophysiology of delirium it is more about the dopamine and acetylcholine and that starts from the thalamus level uh, so uh, benzodiazepines actually can cause more of mental clouding uh, rather than more clarity so that's why it it can leads to uh, 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 it, what does benzodiazepine does it, it basically suppress the cortical functions isn't it so um, that will again uh, increase the level of uh, delirium or uh, sometimes it can miss uh, uh, it can it can increase uh, uh, delirium okay percentage of reversal uh, I, I uh, frankly i don't remember the uh, 
figures. Uh, I will go through any if there are any articles on the reversal. But what we have seen that there are quite good number of patients who comes out of uh, of delirium. But again, we need to remember that this is a, uh, also an indicator of very poor prognosis. Many of these patients, what we saw that they 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 died in a few days or weeks. Then there is a question about uh, uh, metazolam 3200 mg causes respiratory depression. So um, usually means what those I had mentioned was about uh, the 24 hour doses. So uh, and that is used in uh, palliative sedation as an infusion, continuous uh, infusion. So if we are escalating dose uh, properly, then it should not cause respiratory depression. But uh, yeah, there are doctrine of double effect. I think that may be discussed sometime during palliative sedation class or uh, yeah. sometimes in ethics. Exactly. Uh, the, that will be a doctrine of double effect will be dealt with ethics. But yeah. one thing I would just like to add on with medazolam is dose titration. You're not going to give uh, 30 milligrams in one go. It is always given in a titrated dose. All these, as uh, all of you are aware, again and again, as we say, you know, all of you are practitioners. So you will give medazolam in two milligrams, one to two milligram titrated dose. So you always, and especially when you're giving it intravenously, you will give, see the response and give. You're not going to just give continuously. So those are things to be kept in mind. And uh, if it's an infusion, that's a continuous infusion for a long time. And then the, how and where you use it, if you're going to use it for relieving of that particular symptom, or if it is for sedation differently. So what for you're using, when you're using, and how you're going to use it also has to be kept in mind. And even for haloperidol, we start off using as in small doses, 1.5 or 2.5, and then you give 15, 20 minutes, you wait, see the response, and then we, you, we see very good response when it is given for delirium. And in like by 24 hours, you will see the difference usually. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And then maybe um, we can go ahead with the uh, case. Uh, Anu, the last few slides of that case presentation, if you could bring it up, please. Mm -hmm. we start, we'll go from summary, Anu, so that we get an idea. I'll just read it. Or uh, is our doctor there still? She can uh, still read it if she's happy because it'll be nice. Yeah, ma'am, I'm here. I'm yes, here. please. Please go ahead, dear. Yeah. yeah, so so this is a 78-year-old lady, Sunita Devi. She's a diagnosed case of adenocarcinoma carcinoma lungs with tibial metastasis. And she was undergoing palliative care at home. Uh, she then came to the hospital with sudden deterioration in her condition, most likely caused by a cerebrovascular accident. So what had happened is she had had a fall at home and after that she had difficulty eating, she had irrelevant talk and she was, uh, uh, she was agitated and uh, that's when her relatives brought her to the hospital. Um, yeah, so for me, one of the main things that I was wondering was, uh, I mean, so after this, once she came to the hospital, we initially gave her oxygen, we did some investigations, her HP was low, uh, we gave her some antibiotics because her TLC was high. Uh, but finally, we didn't do any further investigations because, you know, she's elderly and her uh, stay, cancer was always already advanced. So there was no further investigations for what we thought was a, probably a stroke, a cerebrovascular accident. And so we didn't uh, do anything further and uh, relatives also wanted to take her home. So she was taken home and uh, she died in, uh, in a few days time. I think within a week she passed. So for me as a physician, my question was, is this justified knowing that there may be alternate options for management or treatment of stroke? Is it okay to anyway send her home because she's old and uh, she's anyway got cancer? So what's the point of treating the stroke? So for me, that was my ethical dilemma. Um, uh, yeah, and so is there any other non-pharmacological management which is possible in this patient 
in which case you know we could do that at home um Yeah, so those were the questions. The first question is, is there any particular time frame to decide what the decide that the specific symptoms are related to delirium? Um, and how can the symptoms be managed? And you know, the caregivers are already distressed by this uh, sudden onset of the condition, and that's why they brought her home, even though they had decided to give a palliative care at home. So these were the points that had come up as uh, which I'd like to discuss. We all of you can participate and um, bring forth your uh, uh, answers and discussion points. And then uh, we have Dr. Pankaj also to take us through and then I will uh, add on afterwards. I think looking at it now, after the class, I feel, you know, her HB was low um, and uh, the stroke, of course, might have contributed to that. She has been unable to eat. So there are so many contributions to uh, to delirium that we could have maybe addressed. Exactly. No, no. So that is why, Dr. I said, like, it will be nice to have, because, see, now you yourself uh can pick up see potentially so many um risk factors were there for for her to go into this yeah. okay so that part is there and um one thing generally itself what i wanted to add on you started off like when we went through the case and that the family had decided for palliative care everything yes fine but then to know allaying or treating each symptom is what is very important that is also care isn't it so uh, that is the important element of palliative care is that see even that doesn't mean palliative care means we are not going to do anything we are going to do an, any anything and everything correct the correctable and also uh, alleviate all their symptoms mm -hmm. and give them assurance especially delirium is a big problem for the family because they are a they are totally upset that someone who was totally fine has changed because of the issue with the chemical and all that we have gone through. So, mm -hmm. and if you correct that and assure them that it can be corrected with medications and give them non-pharmacological and pharma, do give them the pharmaco non-pharmacological advice and do the pharmacological things that we can do. So, talking to the family, allaying their fear and anxiety, telling them that it can be solved can we manage and managing it appropriately mm -hmm. so because the non-pharmacological management no is what we have taken if that is very important because bringing them or keeping them if it is hyperactive do what is needed in the appropriate way if it is hyperactive because they're totally two ends of the spectrum yeah so those things like after the session many of our queries get answered yeah. so that, that as you have mentioned is uh, already what is there and the palliative care element is what i wanted to add on even though the palliative care element is taken and then whatever can be treated and corrected we will always try to correct mm -hmm. and dr pangas if you want to go ahead with uh, the uh, that her query of what whether uh, stroke or thing you go ahead yeah. then i would say mm. yeah so yeah it depends completely on what are the goals of care i think at that point of time uh, uh like sometimes radiological investigations can be very very uh, uh these things can may not be available at those places at the uh, primary or secondary uh, health centers or these can be costly is also so uh, yeah we what uh, uh, the patient's condition before this stroke uh, what is a financial status uh, do they have something to cover these all expenses so uh, those lot of things decides uh, uh, how do you want to go ideally yes we want to do a radiological investigations at least uh, uh, non contrast ct scan of the head may also be okay uh, if if uh, because that is not very very costly uh, so if it is available we can go for that otherwise the best would be contrast enhanced uh, mri of the brain 
uh, one question means uh, uh, i'm sorry i couldn't attend the uh, the case discussion prior uh, uh, the patient uh, was hemiplegic like uh, the upper limb weakness was also there or is it only uh, lower limb uh, so I think it was the left, left upper and uh, lower upper limb. and lower limb. Because what I could see there, there is left uh, lower limb fracture is there, and sometimes because of pain, patient yeah. is not able to move uh, uh, the legs and all. And that is uh, many a time is miss uh, uh, like that is uh, misdiagnosed sometimes. So yeah, if it is a CNS related pathologies, I would prefer to do uh, investigations. Uh, but if uh, the circumstances are like that, like the uh, our, uh, uh, patient uh, uh, is uh, severely ill for very long time and they want to go for symptom control, we can start medications for uh, managing the delirium and uh, uh, and other symptoms, uh, medications can be started. Uh, one question here, what I could see is there, uh, is there any particular time frame to decide uh, that the symptoms are specific to delirium? Uh, I think no, there are nothing like that. We need to evaluate it uh, uh, as early as possible. So in patients who get fracture, uh, uh, very important investigations becomes uh, a, a hemoglobin level and serum calcium level because very often a patient with CA lung with bone metastasis, especially with fractures, they develop hypercalcemia. And that may be one of the reasons for delirium. Pain can be one reason or brain metastasis or brain stroke or uh, uh, and hemorrhage can be other things because your BP was also high in this patient. These all things can be reason, and uh, we need to uh, 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 either symptomatically manage or, or, or evaluate it further. Yeah, anything else? Exactly. The yeah. same thing, only I was also about to say goals of care is the important thing because, Doctor, what when we started off the case itself, she did mention that that patient had three sons and one daughter and son was a healthcare worker and um, he the collective decision was to give her palliative care because she was stage four uh, CA lung and uh, that was. so basically this goals of care is very important and then comes your uh, managing the delirium per se has to be done and then investigation point of view same thing I would say one more thing what I wanted to add on was you do all the investigation if that is going to change your management plan. Okay, because there you have to consider the availability. And then, for example, I'm not aware whether the place where you had itself had the facility for investigation, fine. Otherwise, uh, a, a patient who is in delirium, you have to transport her to somewhere, all that to be kept. You weigh the risk benefit and then go ahead and do all based on the what is the goals of care decided by the whole that the family doctor in total as a team so from there you take on and go from that, that those are the two points i just wanted to add and individually all the non-pharmacological management options also have to be done hand in hand after like during the once you manage it and then like even when they are in the hospital itself those non-pharmacological management options can be told to the family adopted and then can be told to them to be done at home also so that they are able to continue that anything else is there in the entire chat let me quickly check no So hope um, all uh, the queries and discussion from the case per se are okay, or are you happy with the all the discussion points done for, or anything more you want to add on, Dr. Amy? No, ma'am, thank you. Ah. Yeah. Oh, very good. And so yeah. that, because main thing, no, see, these cases are brought up so that, see, something similar, all of us 
when you practice, you will see all these uh, symptoms more often. And then when they come up and then you discuss, they stay very clear with you. So when you manage, it is easier. So that's the main advantage. And haloperidol is very, very useful in managing these patients. In that case, maybe we can come out of the uh, case uh, presentation, uh, Anup. Anything else with the case or the topic? Anything anybody wants to, you can, or anyone can unmute and ask or type either way is fine. Anything, Dr. Pankaj, you want to add on? Uh, I think uh, we have covered most of the things mm. in the cases. Um, nothing. Thank nothing you. Thank you. So I thought the case was also appropriate to the day's uh, topic and took us through well. Yeah. Very good. Is Sri Priya still around? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pangas. We could uh, assume that you might have had a very tiring day and you just jumped into the session without taking at least a small tea break. Thank you so much for that. And I believe that everyone had a uh, better uh, perspective of delirium as this is a very complicated topic. And yes, please do feel free to connect with us in case you have any further more queries after going through the materials and the recordings. And thank you everyone for joining in once again with the promise that we will see you again with another very different topic and yet another remnant faculty. This is Sri Priya along with Dr. Pangas and Dr. Ratha Vagreshi signing off from the Tip Seco Hub. Till the time thank we you. see again, everyone take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sri. Thank, thank you, Radha, madam. Thank, thank you, Ami. Thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Pankaj. Take care. Thank you.